we might as well get going. Um, hi everyone, welcome back again. So we wanted to notify you guys and make an announcement that our new chairs for next year have been elected. So Alexa Lee or Alexa Williamson and Elizabeth Lay will be our new chairs and they'll be taking over and being the ace of UCLA ASDA pre -dental. So we're really excited. They are some all-stars for our committee and they've done a lot of really great work for us this past year. And Don and I are very excited to see what they can accomplish in the upcoming year. So on that note, we'll go to the next slide and tell about, talk a little bit about what we have planned for you guys in the future. Thanks, sir. I think you just click the slide and go over. Okay, perfect. So what we have planned for you guys. In the past, we've always had shadow days at UCLA. So if you guys are in Southern California or close by, your pre-dental committee or pre-dental society or even yourself personally can come for a shadow day at our school, see what classes are like, and also get a tour and just get to meet with Dr. Margolis, our associate dean in person. And it's a really great, great opportunity to get understanding of what our culture is like at our school and if you're potentially interested. So that's potentially in the making. But if we are close in the fall, we might make it into a, sh a virtual shadow day. So be on the lookouts for that. In addition, we're likely going to still offer our video conference calls with Dr. Margolis as well. So if that's something that interests you, can we send out our recap email after this? Please be sure to fill out that survey that's in there where it allows you to show that interest and then we can get back to you guys um, later in the fall. Last, or another thing, so for our future tutoring services, we're considering still offering the personal statement workshops and also the mock interviews as well in the future. So um, if that is something that you're interested in, again, answer one of our other surveys. It's maybe 30 seconds long and you guys will be considered for that in the future. One note on the tutoring services. So recently Dawn and I have been getting a lot of questions and People are asking us to promote their services for mock interviews, uh, personal statements, or even DAT tutoring. One thing that we want to know is you guys need to be aware of the qualifications of those people and do some research. You know, I think it's way more safe for and physically responsible for you guys potentially to search out for pre-dental ASDA communities and committees like ourselves to give you guys some of those resources that are a little more reputable and aren't necessarily just looking to make a profit. So just be wise about that. Um, other thing, Instagram, YouTube, and newsletter. So if you guys don't know, like we have Instagram, we have YouTube, please do follow those, subscribe. And in addition, we're also gonna be releasing a newsletter shortly. So if you are interested in writing and being published as a pre-dental student and you know wanna boost up your resume, feel free to reach out to us and we could potentially uh, feature you in our upcoming newsletter. And then last but not least, hopefully we'll continue to post some these virtual lectures. So again, stay in contact with us as best you can. Okay. So today's topic, acing your dental school interviews. So again, just to recap, please, uh, if you have any questions, type them up in the chat and I'm sure Elizabeth or Michael get quickly to them. And if not, then we'll also have a little Q&A session after this presentation, in which we'll then transfer over to Ariana Motivali and Ariana Perrin for their uh, part of the presentation. So let's get to it. All right, so if you guys don't know who I am, I'm Kevin Maida. I am a current D2, upcoming D3 at UCLA, and I'm the immediate past co-chair for our pre society. Oh, go Alexa. Oh, hey guys, I'm Alexa. Um, I am the current committee co-chair with Elizabeth and I'm super excited to um, start my duties next year and hopefully that we can um, meet more um, and we are looking to be more involved in like um, like internet and like virtual series so hopefully I'll see you more along the way. So let's tell you guys a little bit about ourselves. Okay, uh, so I have kind of a long journey up until dental school. Um, I graduated from the U of A, which is Arizona. Um, I was the first graduating class to graduate in biomedical. So that was like my original plan was I wanted to be an engineer. Um, but then I decided I wanted to apply to medical school um and worked in a hospital for a while and um got some experience there but decided i didn't like it so i kind of 
worked for a couple of years in FieldSense, which was like a huge part of it. I worked there for like three years uh, doing wearable sensor technology, um, but didn't really like it. It was like a very boring job. I wanted to work with people, so decided dentistry would be the perfect fit. Um, and right before dental school, I got married. So um, now I'm living with my husband in the family housing, and this is my family um, in the middle, like bottom. That's like my huge big family. We have, I have five siblings, so I have a really big family. All right, I guess it's my turn. Oh yeah, that's it. <laughs> All right, so yeah, a little bit about me. I love my friends. These are some photos of my friends, and also I'm a big family guy as well. So in the bottom center, you can see my uh, beautiful family with my brother-in-law. Um, I'm a proud Bruin, but I'm also a proud Pepperdine ape. So when I was in college, I used to run cross country and track, and I still hold true to those uh, qualities today. Alrighty, let's get to it. All right, Alexa, go for it. Okay, so this is your typical timeline from putting your application in, or I guess opening up your application to getting accepted, um, which you all will. Um, so May 12th is when the application opened, and then the application submission got extended to June 16th, or I guess the first day that you can submit your application, which is kind of the timeline of where you wanna go. I think I submitted within like two weeks of it opening. Um, just because I was waiting for some letter of rec um, to come in. Um, and then you get some confirmations. You start getting trickle, uh, like emails, like trickling in um, from different schools, depending on how fast they process your application. Um, so they'll say that they've received your application and they'll usually charge you a secondary fee where you can like log in and um, either I think all the secondary is in AdSys, so it's just paying your fee that you would do during that time. Um, and then you get some interview invites early in August through September. It's like the first emails that I got. And then, um, and then kind of like extension of the interviews up until March. Um, and that's usually when they, they kind of close it that March. I think I got my last one in February. And then December 1st is a super exciting day. That's called Decision Day. And um, usually people wait around on their phone like all day trying uh, to see if they'll get a call. Um, and hopefully you will. And um, a lot of people on like Student Doctor Network, I remember were like super excited, like I got into this place. So just look forward to that day. And I want to make one quick note about that last slide too. So you guys should notice the beginning of the application process and the timeline. So June 16th is the current one. And it's important that you guys apply as soon as possible. Um, you guys saw the first interview invites usually happen between August and September. For our school specifically, we actually start offering some interviews in early July. So the faster you guys apply, the more likely you'll be seen by us especially. So, all righty. So big thing about interviews, you need to prepare. That's it. You know, John Wooden said it perfectly. Failing to prepare is preparing to fail. So we have a lot of things planned to show you guys about how to prepare for these things and kill your interviews. So let's get to it. So this is kind of an outline of what we're going to go over. Um, it's kind of a building block of all the things you need to think of when you um, go into your interview. So you're attired, you need to review your resume, um, maybe go to Student Doctor Network to get some uh, advice. Um, so it's kind of all stuff. It's not just one thing that you need to prepare. It's kind of a lot of different things you need to think about. And I'll go into more detail about each one of these things. All righty, so next slide. Okay, so one big thing you guys wanna do is definitely research the schools in which you're applying to. And the reason for that is one, it's to show interest in the school. And so when you go to your interview day and you're talking about, you're having your dialogue with your interviewer, it's gonna show that you, one, you're prepared and you're mature, but then two, it's gonna show that you're interested. And by being interested, it's gonna show the interviewer that you actually do care about their school and not just the chair at their school, right? So you're looking into what the school can provide for you rather than what you can provide the school sometimes. So um, one thing I want you guys to notice is like, 
some of these interviewers, they're not going to remember necessarily what you say, but they'll remember how you make them feel. So by being invested in them, it's going to make them feel great about their school and make them great, feel great about you and that natural association. So some of the things you guys can do in terms of researching is definitely one, check out the specialties that are offered at that school. Some schools don't offer any specialty programs and some don't or some do. So it's really important to be aware of what that school has to offer in that sense. In addition, some schools have special clinic services um, in which they do a lot of community service. Or in our case, we have the CBCE in which we go out into the nation and get more greater clinical experience through these different uh, externships. So being aware of these different facets that schools offer is really critical and important and it just shows that you've done your homework. Um, and sometimes it's hard to find that information. So what can you do? You can ask uh, students at the school as well as just dental mentors that have gone to schools in that area as well as faculty if you have those connections. Um, oh, and then last but not least, so it's important to just prepare in general, right? So if you know if the school is open or closed interview files, that's important in the sense that if you need to express certain aspects of your application and it's a closed file interview, then you have to be intentional about what you're gonna say during your answers. That way they can get a better sense of who you are as a person because they may not know your stats. And then last but not least, you know, so if you're having questions about what kind of things they ask during their interview or how it's structured, the important things to do is to one, check SDN and Alexa will talk about that a little bit later, but then also ask current uh, students as well as like D1 especially because from school to school, from year to year, some of these schools will change up their admissions process based upon new admission counselors or officers that come in. So one thing to be really prepared for is that, you know, what's on SDN may be a little outdated. So asking the D1s there will give you a better sense for that. So SDN, is it good? Is it bad? Um, honestly, it's both. Um, so the pros is that you can get a lot of interview questions to preview. A lot of people will put in, their co in the comments um, how their interview at a certain school went. And so you can get the most updated information about that. Um, let's say you wanna know what your interview went, is gonna be like. Um, you can see kind of what they experienced, maybe um, some questions or maybe it's more ethical question based. Um, so interview tips, um, school insight, you can um, get more information about the school. Um, maybe more questions that you should ask at the interview. But the cons is there's a lot of gunners on student.network. They share their scores, they share their GPA. Um, so that can be really intimidating and it can make you um, more nervous for the interview. Um, so yeah, that includes stress and it can also be misleading. So um, some people might say the interview was like this, but you experienced something completely different. So um, it's not always right. Um, but I do suggest it for um, for getting some interview question preview because a lot of people will put um, questions that sh you should probably prepare for and review for. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Okay, so on that note, when you're preparing for your interview, it's really important to review your application. And the reason why we say that is because it's better for you to be intimately connected to your application and know what's on it more so than the or the admissions officer that's going over it, right? So there's a lot of times in which they'll ask you questions about your hours or different events that you participated in, or even just leadership roles in general. So if you are aware of what's on your application, you'll be able to answer those questions effectively. And it shows that you actually were truthful and maybe not lying on your application. In addition, um, one thing that Alexa did that was fairly helpful with this is that she actually printed out her application and as she traveled to each interview, she would go over and highlight things and try to like make notes of certain things that she said in her application, just the way she was prepared. So that's a little option for you guys as well. Okay, next slide. Um, so practice, practice, practice. Um, use every opportunity you can to kind of practice and think out what you're gonna say. Um, so you can use mock interviews. Uh, we have uh, the, as a pre-dental outreach, um, we are going to do something this coming quarter um, to practice, um, to set up mock interviews and be able to practice that. Um, and then interviewing with family, friends, uh, other pre-dental societies that you're a part of, um, yourself, 
um, you can record yourself and then review that and see kind of how you're pacing everything. If you're too slow, if you're too fast, maybe you're too quiet, um, or just use a mirror. And then you can use online, um, like looking up questions, standard interview questions for dental school, or just like standard interview questions. Um, and then Don's video, which um, we will uh, send after this, um, but that was something that I actually used was um, he put a he put a video on YouTube, and in the comments it had a lot of questions that um, are typically asked at um, dental school interviews. So it goes from like 90% of something you'd be asked to like 70%. So it kind of goes into like things that you're guaranteed to be asked to like things that you don't really need to prepare for, or you if you don't have time. Um, but yeah, practice. I practice with my husband, um, and that was really helpful. And then Kevin, do you want to say something about the outliers? Yeah, book? yeah. So um, if you guys aren't familiar with this book, Outliers by Malcolm Gladwell, his big principle that he shared in this book was this 10,000 hours rule, in which it kind of makes this assumption or this claim that if you practice something 10,000 hours, you'll master it. So one thing I also want to mention is you may not also recognize what is actually practice. And sometimes you think that only interviewing um, skills like is your actual practice. But I'd say for myself personally, I didn't do a lot of practice, but I had a lot of really great conversations with friends while I was on my team. And that almost prepared me for my interviews as well, just because I got used to speaking out loud and in stressful situations. So don't underhand or undersell yourself when you're considering what's your actual practice because a lot of you probably have great interpersonal skills. So we want to cover real quick some uh, do's and don'ts. Oh, okay. Um, and I'm going to point out a few things I can trust you guys can read so I won't belabor every single point. But I do want to point out um, a few takeaways. So the, one of the big ones is like filler words. People all the time say like, um, or they pause, like make weird pauses or they just mumble. You want to try to avoid this as much as possible. You have to consider that your interpersonal skills that you demonstrate during your interviews are basically a demonstration of what you'll be able to do with patients. So a lot of that comes into play when you're talking to, you know, your interviewer and just showing maturity. Um, in addition, I want to make a note about sounding professional in terms of diction, like your word use and also rhythm, right? So you don't wanna be super fast paced where the interviewer can't understand what you're saying. But then also you don't want to use slang or verbiage that makes you sound a little bit immature. So be mindful of the words that you are using and just practice that. That's one thing that I recognized when I was hosting some of my mock interviews was that there was a hard distinguishing line between talking to a friend and talking to a colleague or a professional. So take note of that. Uh, a lot. Um, another thing is you don't want to sound too rehearsed. Some people, we say practice, 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 and they look through all these questions, and then the moment they hear it, they're super excited, and they just go blurting off about some answer. You know, sit, think, breathe, and make it sound genuine. If it sounds too rehearsed, it could be almost robotic, and it's almost untrustworthy. And then last two things. So um, location isn't everything. Sometimes people will say, like, Oh, why do you want to come to our school? And they say, I love the location, but they don't they fail to mention any other benefits of that school. As an interviewer, you don't want to hear that your location is like the best thing by your school. You want to hear maybe that's like the third or fourth thing that's on their list. You want to consider the specialty offered, you know, the strength of curriculum, that kind of thing. So don't oversell that one aspect. And then last but not least, which I'm always a proponent for, is just being kind and polite, you know. Your interview is basically an opportunity for you to sell yourself and to not show any red flags. A lot of the times for us, especially when you're off in an interview, you're basically accepted to our school, you know, unless you happen to do some atrocious thing. So when I was going on my interviews, I always held doors open for people. I always said, please and thank you. And just try to put your best foot forward. And if you do that at the end of the day, I think you guys would be just fine. So. So talking points, these are kind of things that um, are guaranteed to be asked, at least in one of your interviews. Um, so you should know your strengths and weaknesses, at least know two, I would say two good strengths and, and two weaknesses that you can talk about. Um, and roles and responsibilities. So 
um, maybe roles that you've taken in undergrad, responsibilities, um, clubs that you've been involved in, any leadership roles, um, even like work, um, anything that you have put in your activity section of your ATSIS, you should be able to describe pretty well um, what you've done, like how many hours you've done, um, about like how many months you've done it for. Um, just kind of be prepared to be asked that. Um, interests that you have, if you've been involved in sports, um, any hobbies that you have. A lot of the times once they finish asking the required questions, they'll go into like a conversation with you. That's at least what I, I had was, they're kind of sick of asking interview questions, so they might wanna just talk with you, get to know you. Um, so be able to kind of have a conversation with someone, um, casual, I guess casual conversation with like sports or anything that you're interested in. Um, and then brush up on your dental knowledge. If you've shadowed and you wanna talk about that, um, Make sure that you're using the right terminology, dental terminology. Um, just know how you would describe a procedure or something if you want to talk about it in the interview. Um, and knowing yourself is the first step in formulating genuine and thoughtful answers and questions. So um, just you know, review who you are as a person, your interests, your hobbies, things that you would talk about. Um, just make sure that you kind of you have an idea of what you would say if asked about those. And Alexa, do you mind talking about a few points, um, some emphasizing points? So one thing I wanted to mention, kind of like honing on it, is the weaknesses aspect. I saw someone kind of ask a question about that in the chat. So you want to be calculated when you mention some of your weaknesses and consider if this is a weakness that you even want to mention to uh, an interviewer because it could be a huge red flag. So for instance, you know, an easy one is like, most people that go into our profession are perfectionists. But what that means is it slows you down, right? So recognizing, yeah, like I strive for perfection almost everything I do, which sometimes slows me down and I get frustrated. So I try to do this, you know, create a solution, create a positive spin when you're talking about those weaknesses and mention that you're working on them as well. I think that's always a strong point. It's like uh, analyzing those and recognizing them is one thing, but then saying now moving forward is important. So um, yeah, that's all I have to say. Good job, Alexa. And I guess a good strength to have was to show that you're, you're good at working with other people. Um, I know that was like a suggestion that I got was like that you're, you're, you have good teammanship. Yeah. Okay. All right. So next one. All right. So we wanted to give you guys a quick opportunity to take a little quick uh, screenshot of our questions that we have laid out here. These are some questions that you can find in our own interviews or in interviews in general, they're usually just high yield. Um, but we also, what I'm gonna focus on on this slide in particular are the hard or ethical situational questions. I think those are sometimes the most difficult questions for pre dental students or applicants because they don't, they never experienced some of these issues potentially. So one thing that I want you guys to be mindful of is when you're dealing with some of these ethical or situational questions is you just want to demonstrate critical thinking and then you're going beyond what's just on the paper or on the in the question so for instance you want to investigate sometimes you need a little bit further information to make the correct decision so ask more questions don't be dead set on just answering right away uh, for instance on question number five i talk about x-rays and a woman refusing to take them well obviously we need to take x-rays for to for the diagnostic purposes of this exam. However, what if there's an underlying medical condition that you're not aware of and that the patient does know about? And if you don't show empathy and ask further questions, you could potentially harm your patient. So be mindful of these things and just try to show that little extra step of clinical thinking. In addition, another note. So always try for compromise as well. So you're gonna have to weigh out different options sometimes, but don't assume that the answer is either A or B. There's potential that you can make an a C, you know, so look for ways where you can work with your patient or work with the opposing side and like strive for the best result for both sides, you know. And then last but not least, a lot of uh, times I've heard from like colleagues or friends, especially at UCSF, sometimes their students post interviews. And one thing that they'll say is like they want to see empathy and just critical thinking. So, you know, when you're asking some of these questions, it's going to demonstrate that you're considering the feelings and the heart of the other person. So definitely try to emphasize some of these points when you're dealing with these questions. But 
in general, Alexa is going to give you a general formula to follow when you're kind of considering some of these things. So she'll go into that right now. You can go next slide. Sorry. Next. Wait, I oh, went so to the next, slide. Yeah. Next, next slide. Oh yeah, this that's the right one. Yeah. yeah. Um, so most likely you'll be asked a few ethical questions. Um, this is kind of a new trend with dental school interviews. They want to see how you can um, process uh, problems and kind of problem solve through them. So this is kind of a general formula that I saw before my interviews and you don't necessarily have to follow this formula, but it kind of helps you to jog your memory and, and kind of um, help you formulate your thoughts. So first step one is acknowledge. So usually there's two parties involved with an ethical question. So, um, you know, it's either this party gets what they want or this party gets what they want, but you can't really win. So um, acknowledge that, you know, this party might want this and this party might be concerned about this. Um, so just to show that you have empathy, kind of show empathy for both or compassion for both. But then you go into prioritizing. So, but I think it's more important to value the safety of this party or it's more, or it's actually, you know, my job as a doctor to do this. Um, so kind of show, you can even brush up on like HIPAA laws. Um, a lot of them involve like HIPAA or like patient confidentiality, maybe like, um, a mom wants information of their adult child. Um, so you, you would say that, that, you know, I can't present that information or I can't give that information. So it'd be prioritizing that. Um, so try to think as like a doctor. Um, and then step three is propose. So like, if you're pr prioritizing this party, what do you propose? Like, what's your plan of action? What are you gonna do? And then step four is anticipate. So once you make that action, um, a step further is to kind of anticipate what would be the consequences of your action. Um, so that kind of shows that you're, you're thinking like above and beyond than just saying, I would do this, but you'd say, I would do this, um, but I can also see it going this way. And if it goes this way, then I would act this way. Um, sometimes you have like extra time. Um, so kind of have that be something that you can fill the time with. I know when I was asked ethical questions, it was in an MMI interview. And the interviewer just kind of stared at me. Um, so it was kind of hard to take up that two minutes of talking. So um, instead of rambling, kind of maybe come up with like certain situations that you can foresee and then how you would react to those. But that's about it. There's no real formula for ethical questions. They just want to see that you can um, problem solve and think like a a dentist. Yeah, so um, you end that portion where they're asking you questions, now it's your turn to ask them questions, right? And you definitely don't want to be that person that says, oh, nope, I'm great. That just shows that you're not prepared and you're not truly considering what that school has to offer you and how they can benefit you truly as a student. So you definitely want to show that you're interested and you're prepared by asking certain questions. These are some examples in which you guys can ask. Uh, I think it's always great to hype them up, make them feel good about themselves. That's just going to make it, them feel good about you, right? So you can always mention their strengths. Say, hey, I know you're famous or you're known for this, but what are some other things that you guys are, uh, like, that are underlying that we should know about as we're applying to schools and stuff like that? So just be mindful. These are some examples you guys can use. Just feel free to reach out to us or anyone else if you want some more examples. But we'll go to the next slide. So this is the UCLA interview timeline of what I remember. Um, so it's kind of it's kind of detailed um, more than it should be. But um, basically, it started off with an essay. Then faculty came in. They introduced themselves, um, and then you go into your interviews. Um, there was a lunch student panel. So there was um, I think it was about an hour where every um, student from each class came in, and we could just ask questions there's no faculty in the room and that's usually how it is it's it's just the students and, and you um so it's really casual and it's actually really fun so be you know be prepared to ask questions if you really want to know the truth i guess about the school and how they're experiencing it um so that's kind of that was that was my favorite part of every interview was the student panel um, and then you get some financial aid information 
um, with UCLA, you actually try on the white coat uh, on the interview day. So um, it shows that they're really invested in you and that um, it surprised me, um, but it shows that, you know, this is just the next step. The interview is just the, the next step of getting admitted. Um, so feel confident that, you know, when you go to an interview, most schools, they consider this just as the next step, especially if you get an early interview. Um, and that's actually what my interviewer said was, this is such an early interview, um, just relax and like, I just want to get to know you. And so, so be confident. Um, and then we went home. It was a pretty easy day. Um, I don't know, most interviews are, you kind of leave like midday um, and it's usually structured similarly. All right, real quick, we'll talk about attire. I feel like you guys probably know what you should or should not wear, but in general, you just want to display professionalism. So for you guys, wear a nice suit. You'll probably use it in the future anyways. In dental school, we've used it many times now going to different conferences. So just give you a quick heads up. Let's say we talk about girls. Yeah, um, for the ladies, uh, a suit as well, um, skirt and pants suit. Um, closed toed shoes I think are preferable or anything that's like comfortable, um, like flats. Um, and then a bag if you wanna, if you wanna bring one. That's basically it. Yeah, so our last thoughts is like one, be confident, be kind, be positive go get it. Like, don't be afraid. I think the biggest thing people get nervous about interviews because they have to talk to someone, but in reality, this is your opportunity to just show them who you are as a person. And for at least our school in particular, we're not looking to hurt you. We're not looking to stump you. We're trying to see if you're a good fit for us. And in most cases, after you got an interview at our school, you're almost guaranteed acceptance unless you have one of those red flags. So that's why we say, you know, be nice, be kind, be polite, put your best foot forward, and for us, you'll do great. So, all right. And so, yeah, if you guys have questions, type them in the chat. We'll spend a few moments going over some of them. If not, uh, we'll go to Ariana Motivali and Ariana Farron's presentation. Uh, they actually have a really cool presentation about the hot topics in dentistry. So, to give you an idea, this is stuff about organized dentistry, as well as just some controversial issues that are happening in our field right now and may come up in your interviews. So it's good just to be knowledgeable about the dental field, what's happening. That way, when you go to your interviews, you are well prepared and ready to answer any question that comes your way. So Don, do you want to spend a few moments um, navigating yeah. questions? Yeah, let's see. Um... There's one that says, what was one surprising question you were asked in an interview? Um, I, I wasn't really asked any surprising. I think the ethical questions were the hardest for me. Um, so that was, that was kind of difficult. And the way that they had it was they, they kind of stared at you <laughs> um, until you were like finished. They didn't react to like whatever you chose. Um, so just be prepared that sometimes they're actually told to stone face you a little bit. Um, so don't, don't take that personally. Um, just be normal um, and stay relaxed because sometimes they'll try to maybe stress you out or see if that stresses you out. Um, so play it cool. Yeah, um, I saw a question that asked like, what's the percentage of acceptances after interview for us? It's, I would say it hovers around 85% come to our school. And those that don't, it's either one, they had a big red flag, but that's few and far between. The other one is if they're like an out-of-state student and they just have a better offer somewhere else. And so they want to go there. So we're obviously one of the more competitive schools. So we, have, we get competitive applicants and sometimes they get offered to many different schools that are great. So they have to make that hard choice. So that's what kind of plays into our 85%. Yeah, next question says, what tips do you have in order to stand out in case the interviews for all schools are online? That's a good question. So I think at that point, you know, it's almost all the same rules apply. But again, I always love like charm. I think for me personally, that's where I kind of shine. So the moment I knew I had an interview with someone, I could like basically just weasel my way into any school. And that's why I probably got into UCLA. They were probably like, all right, we have to put a filter on for this guy, make sure that we keep him out. But then I started talking to Dr. Margolis 
and game was over. So I don't know. I think just always leaving a positive impression on people is good. You know, they'll remember how they you made them feel, but maybe not exactly everything you say to a T. So, yeah. Even like light humor, like if you can make a, a, a classy joke <laughs> um, or make them smile, I think that that goes a long way too. All right. All right so without further ado, we'll turn it over to the Arianas. Go for it, guys. All right. Hi, hey. guys. I'm Ariana. I'm also Ariana. Okay, and today we're going to be talking about hot topics in dentistry. Uh, this, These are things that, well, what we're going to talk to you about today is different than what you've been learning in the past few weeks, but it's going to be things that you can totally bring up in your interviews, like especially when the interviewer asks you at the end of your interview, like, oh, do you have any questions for me? You could totally bring one of these things up. And it's also being involved in the dental field, uh, being aware of what's going on is also really helpful. Uh, next slide. Okay, so I'm Ariana. I'm the UCLA ASDA chapter legislative liaison. And what that position is, is that I'm supposed to update information to UCLA regarding any policy or change in legislature. Um, and I'm also the district ASDA, district 11 ASDA co-conference chair. And I help uh, set up conferences for California schools. So the, all the schools in the United States are divided into districts and all California schools are in District 11. So I just help um, set up any events for all the California schools. See, Dawn, can you go back a slide or to our title slide? One more. <laughs> yeah, okay, so that just shows our, what we're saying. Um, I am also Ariana, um, and I'm our class's CDA representative. We'll talk a little more about what CDA is later. It stands for California Dental Association, but I represent our class on the state level. And then I am also the um, California Dental Association Student Delegation Vice Chair. And so I represent um, all of the CDA representatives in California. And so we'll tell you all a little bit more about us just so you can get to know us besides the fact that both of our names are Ariana, and then we'll jump right into it. Okay, so I graduated from... <laughs> <Wait>. <laughs> yeah, this one. Um, so I graduated from UC Irvine 2019. Uh, I like hockey, and I'm a Sharks fan. I, grow, I played tennis growing up, and I like to play poker and gamble, but I don't know if I'm supposed to talk about gambling here, so I'll get into it. <laughs> I like to read. Awesome. Um, I have an identical twin sister. She's right there in the corner. I also have a little pupper. His name is Leo. He's the dog in the picture. And I went to Cal Poly San Luis Obispo. Shout out to my Mustangs. I know there's a few of you here. And uh, I've been doing quarantine, keeping myself busy. That's a picture of me in a cardboard box in the corner. Uh, my sister and I have just been finding ways to entertain ourselves. Yeah. So we'll get started. Um, first, I want to, yeah, you can go to the next slide. Um, first, we want to talk about what is organized dentistry. It might be a foreign concept for a few of you. Um, and then we'll talk about uh, the hot topics, which we have promised we'll get there. Um, so organized dentistry is a tripartite organization, which is a fancy way of saying there's three tiers of um, organizations that contribute to what we call organized dentistry. On a national level, it's the ADA, which is the American Dental Association. On a state level, it's CDA, the California Dental Association. And on a local level, um, we all as UCLA dental students are part of the West LA Dental Society, and there's 32 other um, local components throughout the state of California. And so organized dentistry describes the combined efforts of all organizations that work to positively contribute to the dental profession. Through these organized systems, we can achieve, we can advance the profession and better service, better service the public. So just to put that in everyday terms, uh, organized dentistry is basically a bunch of dentists coming together and saying, hey, we can achieve more together than apart. Um, so it's not a, a regular, they're not regulatory bodies, they're not the ones like coming up with uh, laws or um, what are dental mandates throughout the country, like this equals malpractice, this doesn't, that's not what these 
this org these organizations do. They're the ones that are um, advocating for dentists, uh, for dental students, and um, for patients across the country. Um, and we'll talk a little more about what they do throughout the presentation. Next one. And so I wanna talk a little bit more about CDA because um, it's an opportunity for all of you and um, a plug for an organization I love. So uh, like I said, it's California Dental Association and um, they are our state's chapter of organized dentistry. And they have these three main events that I wanted to touch on or three main topics I wanted to touch on. Um, mostly because they present as really cool opportunities for you. So first up, CDA Cares. If you haven't heard of it, it is a biannual weekend clinic that CDA puts on. And basically they provide free dental care to anyone who shows up. They rent out a huge convention center. Um, there's a picture of it in the bottom of the slide. And it is honestly a life-changing experience to go and see um, the impact that a dentist can have on the community. and just how big of a problem access to care is in our, um, yeah, in our community. And um, that is an amazing opportunity for all of you. Yeah, I know in the current COVID-19 era, um, they actually had to cancel the next CDA Cares, super sad. Um, but when, fingers crossed, we get back into things, this is a really cool opportunity for you all to go volunteer at. Um, you can be escorts, you can interview patients, and honestly make a pretty big impact even as a pre-dental student. Um, and it's something that looks really good on your application. I'm not saying just do it for that. I don't think you should do anything just to put it on your application, but um, it's an amazing experience. And if you've done it, for sure share that. Also something that CDA does, sorry, not done, <laughs> is uh, they advocate for dentists. And so we'll talk about some topics that they've been advocating for. And then CDA Presents is another topic or another event um, which ha happens twice a year and they have continuing education courses for dentists and um, there's a huge vendor fair. So all of the different dental vendors come and bring out um, their coolest new stuff and it's a great networking opportunity. All right, next slide. So we'll get right into some hot topics. Before uh, we jump in, I also just wanted to preface by saying that um, we're going to present um, the opinions of these organizations on certain topics. So like, yeah, CDA supports this, ASDA supports this, but that doesn't necessarily mean that's what everyone agrees on. Um, and these are really amazing talking points you can bring to your interviews, but I would encourage you to not just focus on like, oh, like, ASDA supports this, therefore, if I'm asked about this in an interview, like, that's what I'm going to say. The more important thing is to recognize why something is controversial and um, be able if be able to talk about it. And um, by no means are you all going to leave this presentation like an expert on all of these topics, um, but hopefully it gives you an idea of what's happening in the dental industry, and um, you can go look into it more if it sparks some interest. So I want to talk about how COVID-19 has been impacting dentistry. Um, and that really impacts all three facets of dentistry, the patients, the dentists, and us as students. Um, in terms of how it's been impacting patients, uh, we have been, or as dentists, we've been advocating for um, the government to add more dentist, dental benefits to Denical, which if you don't know what that is, um, it is our state, uh, state and federally funded Medicaid program. And so um, over the past few years, we've been able, through CDA's advocacy, we've been able to increase more of more dental procedures that are on Denical, but because of COVID-19 and the fact that there's significantly less income tax and sales tax going into the government, the budget for Denical has been um, pretty much cut in half. And so, we're really taking step backs in terms of the amount of coverage that a lot of people in our state are receiving and um, are presenting a huge access to care issue. In terms of how COVID-19 has been affecting dentists, um, most of them are worried about how to resume practice right now. Um, I put this picture on the right because 
it really emphasizes that dentistry is an aerosol producing profession and aerosols are, you know, those little tiny things that everyone talks about now that spread COVID-19. So um, it, there's huge concern in terms of returning to practice and there being a shortage of PPE, which everyone knows what that is now, personal protective equipment. And ADA and CDA have been doing um, the most they can to advocate for dentists getting PPE and saying that we're not going to return to practice until we get that. And so I just wanted to say, uh, or to touch on that a little more, FEMA is the Federal Emergency Management Agency. Currently, they have all ownership of PPE in the um, country. And a few weeks ago, dentists were placed in the seventh position of priority in terms of who gets that PPE and through ADA and CDA advocacy have gotten us to fourth on the priority which is awesome we cannot do dentistry without PPE um, and what we've uh, organized dentistry has also been working to interpret federal and local mandates for how to go back to practice they're extremely confusing and um, a lot of dentists are just really confused on what do I need to do, what PPE is required, what tests do I need, and so a lot of them are just trying to figure that out and figure out if they can get loans from the government. Um, and I also wanted to touch on the fact that dentistry is really a leader in infection control um, from the get-go because dentistry is an aerosol-producing uh, profession. Dentists have really thought about infection control and we really set the standard in a lot of ways for what the rest of medicine um, does. And so uh, we are in good hands in terms of the people that are gonna figure out uh, how to deal with the situation. And then students, the other Ariana will talk about this a little more, but a huge issue right now is the fact that our fourth year students um, currently do not, or the traditional way that our fourth year students would be licensed is by taking an in-person exam on a patient and with the current situation that is not an option and so we're left wondering how these fourth year students are going to become licensed dentists before graduating and so yeah ariana will talk a little more about um all that's happening right now with licensure reform and um how that presents as an issue but we can go on to the next slide all right so teleorthodontics I'm sure a lot of you have heard of this um, Smile Direct Club and Candid. These are basically um, companies that have super clever marketing and target to this hip younger generation. I put a screenshot of their website on there and they're saying that they can give you straight teeth at the third of the price of orthodontics and you never have to meet your dentist in person. So you basically go in, they scan your teeth, and um, they ship you clear aligners and they're like, you're gonna have a great smile. In fact, today I received this in the mail, which I thought was hilarious because we were giving this presentation today, but it's literally an advertisement for Smile Direct Club, which is super ironic. Um, anyways, so they have recently, or last year, uh, initiated a partnership with CVS, which I just put on there so that you realize that this is only picking up more. Um, and really the trend is that everyone wants like consumer dentistry and consumer healthcare in general. People want like, I wanna do it at home myself and look, this is so easy, like, ah, yay. Um, but I wanna present the American Association of Orthodontics stance on this is that uh, patients who participate in these um, companies should really understand the risks involved um, there's a large influx of patients who have straight teeth now, but can no longer bite very well. In fact, patients have been complaining of their teeth falling out after doing procedures like this. And so the point is that there's a reason why orthodontics is a specialty of dentistry that you go to after having completed dental school. And um, it's really multifaceted and requires adequate training to be able to assess uh, the certain needs of patients. In reality, this may work for certain simple cases, but um, in reality, like your bite and your smile are way more complex than um, what you can get in a little scan. And so uh, if you want, look into this more, but it's gaining popularity and I would uh, recommend to avoid these uh, companies. 
And I'll hand it over to the other Ariana. All right, so we're going to step away from CDA and organized dentistry, and we're going to talk about ASDA, and I'm super passionate about ASDA, so I might have like word vomit right now, but <laughs> <laughs> what ASDA is, is the American Student Dental Association, and you can think of it kind of like the government for dental students and how they are supposed to protect and advocate for dental students' best interests, kind of like how the national government you could think is supposed to protect like our best interests as citizens, but I don't want to get too political, <laughs> but that's how you can think about it. And when you go into dental school, you're going to definitely learn about ASDA and some schools are really into ASDA and some are not so much. So if you're applying to a school that is like all about ASDA, I would definitely mention that in an interview or something to, so, so that they know that you know what ASDA is. Um, as to host a lot of conferences and it helps with like professional growth, leadership, advocacy, and a lot of networking. So in dental school, you're gonna take a lot of science courses, you're gonna take dental courses, you're gonna do preclinical labs, you're gonna do clinical stuff, and that all the rest you have to learn like outside of dental school, which is through ASA or through CDA. So that's why I really recommend you guys get involved in some sort of organization once you join dental school. Uh, next slide. Okay, so licensure reform. So right now with like COVID-19 and everything, licensure reform is the only thing you're gonna see like in dental news because um, it's changing so much right now. But what it is, is in order for a dentist to legally practice, you need to pass a licensure exam for your state so that you can practice afterwards. And it varies by different states. Different states have different policies for how you can get licensed. In California, we need to pass the REB exam. And the controversy is that most licensure exams rely on live patients. And that's the whole issue here, is that you have to think about the ethicality of it all. Is it ethical to use live patients? And is it reliable? So how do you standardize an exam? So you can think about it of like, how do you standardize an exam if my patient is different than like his patient? How do you know what's passable and what's not passable if you're using different people in order to pass someone, right? Um, you also have to think about is it in the best interest of the patient themselves to be a part of this exam? So for this exam, you need to find your own patients who meet certain criteria in order to pass. And you could easily see one of your patients in clinic and say, oh, that person has exactly what I need for my exam. I'm going to save, I'm going to hold off treating this patient so that I can use him for my licensure exam. And is it the best interest of that patient to hold off on those things? So that's another thing you have to think about. Also, there are times where students will pay for their patient to like be in their exam to, and that's also an ethical issue you have to think about. Um, in the biggest issue I hear with like the current licensure is finding patients and how stressful that is because you pay for this exam and you get all your patients and that patient has every right to not show up and that's just a stressful environment right because this is like to get licensed and you're relying on your patient so that's another issue so in response to this as the stance on licensure is to eliminate using live patients, whether that be through DL OSCE or mannequin based exams. So the DL OSCE is a licensure exam that just is about to be implemented in June. So it's a totally new thing that's finally being implemented, but only in four states. So we still have ways to go. But what it is, is it doesn't use live patients. It doesn't use mannequin based. It's just clinical questions with pictures. And that's another issue is that how can we get licensed with an exam that doesn't test our hand skills? So that's another issue. Um, for mannequin based exams, you can think of them as being reliable and objective, right? Because you have a mannequin, everyone could get tested the same way and you can test anything you want. There's, you're not limited by what your patient has. You can test any field of dentistry. Um, and it's also psychometrically valid, which means that stress you get from working on a live patient 
should be the same as when you work on your patient and when you work on a mannequin. You still want that there to test like the stress part of it. Um, and that patient burden, thank goodness, is eliminated. Like you don't have to worry about your patient showing up or not. So that's a whole lot on licensure reform, but we're gonna move on. Next slide. Okay, yeah, student debt. Um, so before I get into this, I don't wanna scare all you guys. Student debt is just something we live with as being in a part of the dental profession is really expensive and we live with it and you get through it, but to a certain extent or in the future, it won't be worth it anymore, right? So as the stance is reduce the burden of student debt by reducing interest rates and better refinancing opportunities. So as the debt increases, soon it won't be worth your return. And this ca can cause students to not apply to dental school, right? I mean, I already know of people who haven't applied to dental school because they know it's so expensive. And this is an access to care issue. And I'm pretty sure in one of your guys' interviews, in one of those essays you have to write, um, maybe the interviewer will ask you this question of, what is a burden on the dental field right now? Or what is the topic concerning dental field? And all of you guys, or most of you guys are gonna say access to care, access to care. Everyone's gonna say it, but you guys can get totally more specific on that. And you can say, well, the dental student debt is so high and that can cause an access to care or cause a lack of access to care. Um, and it adds to that issue. So what are the effects of having such a high student debt rather th other than like, oh, I have to pay off so many loans, is that it affects students wanting to go into residency programs. So say I have $300,000 in debt and then I wanna go three more years of residency school with more debt, it's for some people that's just not plausible. So it's something you have to worry about. Um, for me personally, I like to go into academia or public health and we all know that's not where the profit is, right? So. I would have to worry about like, how am I gonna be able to you know, become faculty soon if I have so much debt that I need to cover? So I'll probably be working before I, like working in a practice before I even start to go into academia. And what issue does that cause? Well, that causes less faculty. And who, and in regards to public health, who better to help this access to care issue than people in public health? But when there's no profit, how, how, how do you go into that? It's kind of difficult. Also, once you do go into private practice, having a lot of debt may influence who you want to see. So maybe you'll, oh no, go back. <laughs> um, so maybe you won't accept the uninsured or Medicaid patients because you need money. You want reliable patients who have insurance and you wanna make sure you're getting paid, right? And, but let's be real, the access to care issue isn't for those reliable patients. It's for, it's for the non-reliable patients, the patients who don't have insurance. So that burden becomes higher. Um, but at the end of the day, I don't want to scare you guys because like everyone lives with this, but it's still something we should be aware about. So in the future, we, we can do something about it. Okay, next slide. Okay, mid-level providers. So in my UCLA interview, I was asked about mid-level providers and I didn't know what it was. I answered the question incorrectly. Like thinking back, I, I totally messed up. Like I don't even know what it was, but I'm still here, so it's okay. But for you guys who might get asked this, you should know what a mid-level provider is. So what it is is an individual who's not a dentist but performs irreversible procedures. So that's like, uh, drilling a hole in someone's tooth, right? Like to get rid of a cavity or something. Um, some states have implemented this so that um, they can evade this access to care issue. So they're providing a, a task or a procedure that a dentist would for a lower price. And as the stance is against mid-level providers. Um, and I think from, yeah, no dentist would be like pro mid-level provider, I think, because you, they're taking away the job of a dentist. And they believe that, Asa believes that only dentists should perform these irreversible procedures. But as Asda, if I'm saying, oh, sorry, go back. <laughs> as Asda, if I'm saying like, oh, I'm against mid-level providers, you have to have a rebuttal, right? You have to say, what are you gonna do about that? So to fix that, um, 
as I mentioned, some things that they are for, but it's obviously not enough. And I just want to talk about them really quickly. So for community dental health coordinators, those are people who connect patients in underserved communities to available dental care. So they kind of match people together. Um, expanded dental, expanded, expanded function dental assistants um, don't do irreversible procedures, but they can like fill a cavity after the dentist drills that hole, for example, so that the efficiency of the practice is increased, but it's not like a cheaper replacement. It's not like a dental therapist. Um, and I also want to mention about expanded Medicaid dental benefits and increasing reimbursement rates. So the idea behind this is that if I'm increasing my reimbursement rate um, for dentists, that means that the dentist is getting more money from the insurance company. Um, to charge for that procedure. So say I normally charge $1,000 for like a crown or something, the insurance company will charge, a person with insurance, a insurance company would charge $700. But if that was increased to $800, that means I'm getting a hundred more dollars. So if we're increasing that number, it means more dentists will cover Medicaid patients because they are getting more than what they normally would. And then they think that more patients would go to the dentist because of this. Okay, next slide. <laughs> okay, so for water fluoridation, this is something you're gonna learn in dental school and you're gonna learn about all the chemistry behind it, but um, it's still something surprisingly that affects communities today. Um, so fluoride is a naturally occurring element in water and it prevents tooth decay, but too much fluoride can cause fluorosis. So like in the image you can see, first it start, the tooth starts turning white and then starts turning brown. Too much fluoride can cause that. Um, and the, but the misconceptions about fluoride is that, is that it isn't safe, but it's only not safe to a certain degree. Like if it's too much fluoride, yes, that will cause fluorosis, but it has been proven that fluoride prevents cavities. Um, another misconception is that fluoride additives are not beneficial, and that is also false because a fluoride ion is a fluoride ion. Whether it's naturally in the water or whether I'm adding <laughs> the fluoride, it's going to do the same thing. Um, people also believe that add, uh, water fluorination is an expensive process, but it's just a minuscule thing in the long run because you're going to save more money in regards to preventing ca caries or cavities and treating them. Um, the CDC mentions that water fluoridation as one of the 10 great public health achievements of the 20th century. And I don't know about you guys, but me like being a dentist and hearing like, oh, I'm top 10 for something, that's exciting. So it's, it's a really cool thing. Um, it's stated that 0.7 milligrams per liter of fluoride in water is safe and reduces caries. Um, caries, this is another thing I didn't know when I was in dental school, caries is the disease that causes cavities. So you're gonna hear that in dental school and you're gonna be like, what the hell is that? But it's just the disease that ca causes those holes in your teeth. <laughs> um, so as this stance is pro water fluoridation in community water, um, and I just want to say, because some people think of adding fluoride into our water as medication without consent, and I just want to say that fluoride is already in the water, but regulating the amount is what we're focusing on. So there's some communities that don't have that much water, and if you added, or don't have that much fluoride in their water, and if you just add some fluoride, you know, you can prevent ca caries. And then there's some communities that have too much fluoride, and that could cause fluorosis. So it's about... Um, having a good level or stabilizing this level of fluoride in our water. Okay, and then next slide. And I gave some um, sources, I think Kevin's gonna send them out to you, just if you wanna search up more hot topics, if you are interested. Um, I know that like a lot of people might not even be interested. A year ago, I hated politics. I didn't care about this stuff, but now I am because um, I see like the impact it has on me personally, and I think that's for the other Ariana also. So yeah, thanks. Yeah, so if you guys are curious, um, all these links that were provided both in mine and Alexa's presentation, as well as the Ariana's presentation, we will be sending those out to you guys in our recap email, hopefully tonight or tomorrow, depends how busy I am. Um, but yeah, you know, honestly, I want to give a lot of credit to the Ariana's. They're heavily involved in CDA and ASDA, and they are 
very aware of these advocacy initiatives and efforts. And it's something that you guys as pre-dentals, if you do happen to know these things and can bring them to the, your interviews, it will definitely boost you up in terms of being an applicant. So being mindful of these situations is great also just because you need to know what you're getting yourself into coming into a dentist in the future. So definitely pursue these things. They're great. And if you have any questions about, you know, whether or not there are state level, aside from CDA or from California, yes, there are other um, dental associations in other states. Because I know there's some people out here who may not just be from California. So, all right. <laughs>